Okay, welcome everybody. And right now we're going to do construct validity. Uh, and start off, here are the different types of validity that we've been talking about. We're looking at uh, construct validity, which is how well you operationally define the hypothetical constructs in your experiment. So it comes down to Basically, you're going to take a construct such as helping behavior, and how are you going to measure that? Well, you need an operational definition to measure that. So, for example, uh, we operationally define it as the number of boxes somebody will move for us if we ask them. And it kind of makes sense, and all constructs should make sense. That is, if somebody is being more helpful, they'll move more boxes for us, and if somebody is being less helpful, they'll move fewer boxes. So that is a good operational definition. And so construct validity is whether or not the operation, operational definitions are good. That is, whether or not they're well chosen or not. Uh, you know, we've already talked about uh, you know, DV type operational definitions with the helping. And we can now talk about IV, independent variable operational definitions. Going back to the same example from the uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, example experiment in the first two uh, research methods videos, uh, mood was the independent variable construct. And that was operationally defined by getting positive or negative feedback about how well you did on an important exam. And again, it makes sense that if you receive negative information about how well you did on an important exam, that should put you in a bad mood. If you receive positive information, that should put you in a good mood. And so with independent variables, we want to know if the IV and its operational definition worked as it did. Now, there are several ways you can do that. The first is a manipulation check. Uh, that is you uh, actually uh, check to see at the end of the experiment whether or not people noticed or responded to the manipulation. Uh, in the case of the test feedback, you could give them a short mood inventory, and hopefully the subjects in the experimental or the positive feedback condition uh, would be in a better mood than those in a, the negative feedback condition. Uh, you should also uh, do a pilot study uh, that is, a pilot study is a small study before your main experiment that gets the IVs or the DVs and especially their operational definitions working and making sh and checking to see if they're working before you do the full experiment. So you would do a pilot study where you give people the negative or positive feedback and you measure their mood and you hope to see that positive feedback leads to a positive mood negative feedback leads to a negative mood. You can also use pre-existing independent uh, variables from other studies. You know they've worked before, so they probably will, will work this time. Uh, so uh, that's how you go about doing an experiment, uh, doing an independent variable uh, you know, uh, pilot study or making sure that they work. Uh, with DVs, uh, in general, we often use uh, pencil and paper tests or other type of tests, you know, interview tests for DVs. And once we get to the paper and pencil tests and other types of tests, we move into the area of psychometrics. And uh, psychometrics is the statistics of measuring things. And so in the statistics of measuring things, we're going to be interested in uh, two key concepts which is whether or not that variable has good validity and good reliability. And as I always say, if you're going to use a test without reliability or validity information, you're going to have a bad time. Okay, uh, and this uh, is important, an important warning, uh, because students often make up surveys. They want to they're interested in uh, people's feelings about their body image, so they just sit down and come up with questions uh, that they think would measure how people feel about their body image. Uh, and I know that this doesn't work for several reasons. First off, I've supervised too many student uh, research studies 
where they do that and it doesn't work. And uh, you know, also when you're doing that, you're not following the normal procedures of test construction and you don't have any uh, validity or reliability information. So therefore, you're gonna have a bad time. Researchers might make the same mistakes as students and they often do. And so therefore, it's important to really understand these important psychometric properties uh, you know, uh, understand reliability and validity and also uh, understand uh, test construction. And if you don't want to construct a test, it's very easy to find one. Here's just a few of the uh, compilations of tests. Each one of these books contains hundreds of tests of different topics. Or you can go to PsycInfo and through the advanced search, just search for tests, or there's psych tests, which is a database with just psych tests. And you can also use one of the more popular surveys, uh, the BBI, the Rorschach, uh, the Myers-Briggs, the five-factor model. Uh, there are many of these existing ones. And there, uh, looking pretty cool, uh, is Herman Rorschach. Uh, and one uh, point that, uh, you know, a, a pet peeve of mine, uh, didn't really want to show a Rorschach ink blot because that's unethical. Uh, the Rorschach test assumes that you have not seen any of the ink blocks, blots beforehand. And whenever I see a TV show or a movie that has a real Rorschach ink blot, I say, oh, bad, that's bad. So now let's say that we are we found a test and it has validity and reliability information, or we want to create a test and so we need to generate our own validity and reliability information. What are these concepts? So first off, validity. A valid test measures what it was designed to measure. And so uh, what that means is if I have a test and I expect it to measure body image, beliefs, it should only measure body image beliefs, and it should not measure self-esteem, or it should not measure mood. That is, sometimes the questions you ask on tests will pick up two different constructs, and validity means that the test only measures one construct, the one that you intend it to do. The way that we generate information about this is through uh, the construct validity method. Uh, we assume that uh, a test should correlate well with similar tests, and that a test should correlate poorly with dissimilar tests. And if we find that's true, then we have uh, evidence for construct validity. Uh, the way that we normally do this is through a multi-method, multi-trait approach. And so what we do is we have two different traits that we want to look at. Uh, let's say that we want to look at, uh, you know, uh, masculinity as a trait. So we need another trait to compare that with uh, that's measured by the same test. Usually femininity is measured by the same test. So we'll use those two traits. So we have uh, masculinity and we have femininity. Then we have two different methods that measure those two traits. So the BSRI and the PAQ both measure those two traits. So what we do is we give those two tests to people and we should expect that using the same method, uh, that is, uh, using the BEM sexual inventory uh, and using different traits, that is, masculinity and femininity, when we compare those to each other, uh, they should not correlate well because masculinity and femininity are not the same thing. And we call that discriminant validity, and that should have the lowest correlation. Uh, then what we do, is we use different methods, the uh, PAQ and the BEM sexual inventory, and we correlate together people's scores on the same trait that is masculinity. And this should have the highest uh, correlation, and this is, we call that convergent validity. And if we find uh, discriminant validity, that is a low correlation there, and uh, convergent validity, a high correlation here, then we say that this is a uh, valid test. And so, for example, we go ahead and do this, and when we correlate 
uh, the BEM sexual inventory M, a masculine scale, with itself, we get a correlation of 0.85. All that is is reliability, which we'll get to next. Uh, but then when we correlate uh, masculinity on the BEM sexual inventory with femininity on the uh, EPAQ, uh, what we get is a very low. Nope, that's screwed up. Okay, so what we do then is uh, we uh, do that example. And so first off, we correlate uh, the BEM sex, sex role inventory masculine scale with itself. That gives us a correlation of 0.85. Uh, that's reliability, which I'll explain to you in a minute. Uh, then what we do is we correlate uh, the same method, the BSRI, with different traits. So we correlate the BSRI masculine scale with scores on the BSRI feminine scale. That correlates 0.14, and that's our discriminant validity. Uh, then we correlate uh, different methods with the same trait, and that gives us our convergent validity. So we correlate the BSRIM, uh, BSRI masculine score, with the B EPAQ masculine score. And that gives us a 0.72, and that's evidence of convergent validity. So with low, uh, with low discriminant validity, R equals 0.14, and very high convergent validity, uh, 0.72, that's evidence that uh, the BSRIM is a valid uh, measure. Reliability is the second really important psychometric uh, property. And reliability means that you're measuring the same thing twice. And if you think about it, any measuring device should measure the same thing twice. That is, if I hop on my uh, scale, my bathroom scale, and it says I weigh 200 pounds, and then I hop off it again, and then I hop on it again, and it says I weigh 180 pounds, and then I hop off it and then hop on it again, and it says I weigh 150 pounds, are you going to trust that scale? No. And the reason why, it's not giving you the same measurement twice in a row. That's what reliability is. Uh, the reliability of responses to a survey is also important to determine because unreliable surveys increase the amount of error in a test. So not only are you getting unreliable information, but you're getting more error in your experiment. So if participants respond to questions in a different way at different times, or responding in different ways to different sets of similar questions in the survey, the researcher will not be able to draw accurate conclusions. And this uh, little... Uh, equation is very important. That is reliability. Uh, the observed score, that is the score that you get, for example, uh, you get you take the BSRIM and you get a score of uh, you know, a 6.2. That score of 6.2 is made up of your true ability, that is your true level of masculinity, plus random error. And so since uh, your Observed score equals your ability plus error. Less error means that the score, the test is measuring your true ability, which means that it's more reliable. There are several ways that we measure reliability. Uh, there's test, retest reliability. That is, we expect scores on some tests to be consistent over time. So what we do is we give you a questionnaire this week, and then we wait until next week, and we give you the questionnaire again. We do that to a lot of people, and then we correlate the scores from the first administration to the second administration. Uh, if the questionnaire has good test-retest rel reliability, then each time the person takes the questionnaire, his or her, his or her score should be similar. Uh, and test-retest reliability is typically determined from a relationship of the same individual scores on a questionnaire when he or she, she takes the questionnaires at different points in time. How long do you wait? Well, it depends on the theory and the uh, trait. IQ and extroversion are very stable, and so you could wait a year or two between administrations. 
uh, you wouldn't want to do that because you want to get your study published, but you could, and it would be very reliable. Mood and individuation are unstable, and so you'd have to measure those, you know, especially if it was state mood, within uh, minutes of each other. So it really depends on the theory. Uh, another way of measuring reliability is internal consistency. Uh, and we measure internal consistency, and as the name implies, this is internal to one test, and we measure it internally because for some reason or another we don't want to give two tests over a certain time period. Uh, it's impractical to do that, or something about the trait or the test makes it very difficult to do that. For example, uh, people may respond to the test the first time taking it, and that may change how they respond to the test the second time. Very much like an internal validity, the idea of a testing threat. Uh, and so when you have situations like that, you can't use test-retest. What you're going to do is look at internal consistency. And this looks at, inside the test, how similar the scores of different items are to each other. And there's two ways, in general, that we calculate this. One is the split-half method, and the other is calculating Kronbach's alpha. Uh, in terms of the split-half method, what we do is we literally, or actually figuratively, split the test into half. Uh, if the test has 20 questions on it, like the BSMR, we look at the first 10 and the second 10, and we treat those as two different tests, and we correlate them with each other. And we would expect that if it's reliable, the two halves would correlate well with each other. Another way is totally statistical, and it's called Kronbach's Alpha. And it looks at the overall correlation of pairs of items on the test. So it correlates all the items on the uh, test and then compares that to the overall variance of the uh, test, and that gives you a level of internal consistency we call Kronbach's alpha. And please note that this is not the same as the alpha level in statistical testing. All of these methods with reliability uh, will give you uh, a number between 0 and 1, and you can... Uh, you know, treat that as a uh, correlation. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, with some of those measures, it actually is a correlation. Or you can treat Kronbach's alpha as if it was a correlation. And so we're going to get a number from 0 to 1. Uh, how do we uh, you know, evaluate that? Well, the rubrics are 0.71 is the bare minimum. Uh, and as I'll show you in a minute, that means that half of the test score is error and half is the trait. Thanks, dear. Fine. Okay, so with all of these methods of reliability, you're going to get a number uh, from 0 to 1. And you can treat this number as a uh, correlation coefficient. Uh, so, you know, and in some cases it actually is a correlation coefficient, or in Kronbach's alpha case, you can more or less treat it as a coefficient. So how do we evaluate that? We use these rubrics. First off, 0.71 is the bare minimum. Uh, with a reliability of 0.71, half of the test score is error. The other half is trait. Uh, that's not a good situation, but that's the bare minimum. Uh, and I'll explain to you how we get that number in just a minute. Uh, one is uh, no error and is pretty much impossible. Uh, point, uh, you know, a reliability in the 0.8s is considered a moderate level of reliability, and in the point nines, it's considered a good level of reliability. I recently designed a test, and the, and the uh, uh, Kronbach Alpha was uh, 0.91, and I was very happy with that because that was a very good reliability. Uh, and just remember, unreliable tests add error variance to the data, and remember, error variance decreases statistical power which we'll be talking about later on when we talk about statistical conclusion validity. Uh, so we want to have reliable tests so that we know we're measuring the same thing, but also we want to keep error at a minimum in our experiment. And finally, uh, you know, 
I talked about why 0.71 uh, was the bare minimum, and let me explain how we know that. Uh, with reliability, because it's a, co co a, co a correlation coefficient, we can also easily calculate the coefficient of determination. That is, we take the uh, you know, reliability and we square it. And once we do that, we get the percent of the test score due to true ability. So let's say that we uh, you know, look at a test and it's alpha level, that is it's chrome back alpha is 0.75. So I take 0.75 and square it, that gives me 0.56. And what that means is 56% of the test score is to, due to the true ability. And the other 44% is due to error. Uh, and so as another example, the BSRI masculinity scale, uh, that was uh, 0.85. Uh, remember back when we were doing the multi-method, multi-trait uh, method, uh, when we take the same test and the same trait and correlate with each other, well, that's reliability. Uh, you know, that uh, reliability was 0.85. So we scare, square it, and that gives us 0.72. And so when you get a test score from the BSRI and it tells you what your level of masculinity is, uh, you know that only 72% of that score, that number the test is telling you, is really your level of masculinity. And fully 28%, or about a, a fourth of that test score, is actually error. And that means that a fourth of that number you really can't trust. Uh, and getting back to why 0.71, an alpha level of 0.71 is the bare minimum, because 0.71 times 0.71 is 0.50 which means half the test score is error. And you know, we'll talk about error and why that's bad in future uh, you know, lectures about statistical conclusion validity. All right, bye-bye.